Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the session. I, I have a great pleasure to moderate uh, this panel. My name is Joanna Mazurkiewicz. Uh, and uh, during uh, the discussion, uh, we will dwell into the uh, transformative impact of two crucial EU initiatives. The first one is the EPPD uh, directives, so the Directive of Energy Performance of Building. And the second one is the uh, Social Climate Fund, so the fund that is dedicated to mitigate uh, the impacts of the energy transition uh, to the vulnerable groups. So uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Mrs. Justyna Glusman, Managing Director, Association Renovation Wave in Poland. Uh, Mr. Rutger Broer, Project Management uh, in Building Performance Institute Europe. And Mr. Krzysztof Mrozek, National Campaigner and the Polish Bankwatch Network. Yeah. Um, before we start, let me give a really brief introduction about what the Social Climate Fund is, and also a few words about the EPB uh, uh, Directive, as we will then be uh, sure that we are on the same page. Uh, so in July, 2021, the European Commission proposed to extend the emission trading scheme uh, to the buildings and transport sector. And as a part of the scope, the Commission also proposed to introduce the Social Climate Fund, especially uh, to mitigate the impact of the ETS extension on vulnerable groups. And the uh, fund will be available from 2026. Uh, and should be should mobilize over 86 billion euros. Uh, the fund is dedicated to finance temporary direct impact sub, uh, income support for vulnerable households and to support measures and investments that reduce the emissions of building and road uh, transport. And this um, this last issue, I mean, uh, reducing the emissions is building, give us a link to the EPBD directive. So the regulation that aims to decarbonize uh, building stock in the EU by 2050, and also the directive that uh, creates a stable environment for, for the investments. And uh, the main points or the main regulations are the energy classes for buildings that should be implemented, uh, also minimum standards for modernized uh, buildings, the assessment of the building's uh, global warming potential throughout the whole life cycle, and also the common use of solar energy in buildings. And also, I think that the milestones are also important here, as till 2013, uh, 30, sorry, all new buildings will uh, are, are, are supposed to fulfill the zero emission standards and will be equipped with the photovoltaic installation. And also till 2030, 16% of the most energy inefficient buildings uh, are to undergo the retrofitting. So according to and saying this, I think that we can just uh, start our discussion. And uh, I would like to start from uh, that point that um, even though most uh, discussion around implementing, especially uh, the directive, uh, focus on the technical issues and uh, the timetable that is required for achieving the mind stores. I'm pretty sure that uh, actually the mm, real results of the directive uh, goes far beyond the technical issues. Uh, so I would like to ask you uh, whether the EPB directive holds significance uh, to your area's activity and to your country also, and what are main challenges, uh, including social ones, related to this directive. And maybe let's we'll start with Krzysztof. Thank you very much. Uh, does it work? Perfect. Uh, it's a Great pleasure to, to be here and uh, thank you for the opportunity to to discuss EPBD and, and later Social um, social Climate Fund um, and to represent the CE Bankwatch Network here, the organization um, active in the Central and Eastern Europe 
region and for almost uh, 30 years uh, focus on making public money work for the public, for the societies. Um, and for to, to make public funding work, we need a tangible structure and a plan how to spend it. And that's why we see the um, energy performance in buildings directive as a, a key component of uh, implementing the European Green Deal. The, the European Green Deal is a big strategy of the of the EU, but it needs to be operationalized in order to uh, to make it work, to see what we want to achieve and how we want to to get there. So EPBD is um, the key element of uh, introduction of the European Green Deal into the building sector and making sure that uh, it is uh, gradually decarbonized. Currently, um, around one third, a, a bit even more of um, um, greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas emissions in the EU come from the building sector. Uh, and unlike the uh, energy system or heating, uh, the uh, building sector is uh, one of the most difficult to decarbonize because we have millions of houses, uh, millions of households in uh, each country, each in a little bit different situation uh, with uh, people struggling to heat their homes and keep them warm during the winter or cold during the uh, summer. Um, and each of them wants to uh, live in, a, in a comfortable conditions with uh, decarbonization on climate action uh, being only on the latter place for uh, for them. So EPBD is structuring and uh, accelerating uh, building renovation. The, the plan was to, to get us closer to reach the EU reduction targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 55% at the end of this decade and achieving the so-called net uh, zero emissions uh, by 2050. Uh, and the EPBD was uh, finally approved uh, by the Council last Friday. Uh, however, we haven't opened the champagne because um, it's not perfect. It was much watered down compared to the plan, to the initial um, project shown by the Commission three years ago as part of the Fit for 55 package. Uh, and it's definitely not uh, what uh, experts and civil society organizations recommended. Uh, and we are very much concerned that in the current form, the EPBD uh, is not getting us close enough to achieving the reduction targets. Um, however, uh, it is still a very important step on the decarbonization uh, paths. We, we see, of course, a number of challenges related to the EPBD implementation. First of all, obviously the, the building renovation costs uh, impacting the households. Here, of course, we have a solution uh, or part of the solution, which is the social climate fund that we will discuss later on in this panel. Um, second of all, a lot of myths, fake news amplified uh, on uh, social media that are undermining the society um, endorsement of the of the climate action whatsoever. Um, in many discussions before on um, the European Green Deal Fit for 55, uh, I was asked, will people be deprived of their homes? Uh, will they be able to sell their uh, houses if they, uh, if they wish on the market? Um, and, and so on and so forth. A lot of fake news is being spread uh, around the EPBD with um, only a very little counteraction from the commission, from the institutions, from the national authorities. So we risk that um, the uh, this whole campaign um, around EPBD will undermine the implementation of the, uh, of the Green Deal. And uh, the last challenge is how to um, combine the social aspect, meaning securing that people are not put into energy poverty, that they can comfortably live in their houses with climate action. Um, energy poverty in Europe is increasing. Uh, the estimations are that um, over 50 million households um, are already in the uh, energy poverty. 75% uh, of buildings uh, on our continent uh, are deemed uh, energy ineffective. And on the other hand, 
last month, March, was 10th in the row, uh, the hottest month in the history, uh, according to the Copernicus data of the, of the EU. And we see that the climate crisis is increasing and we need to take action uh, immediately. Um, maybe I will stop here. Uh, I'm happy to continue with further questions. Thank you very much, Krzysztof Justyna. Can I ask for your insights? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in this uh, interesting and timely debate. As uh, Krzysztof said, the PBD was voted uh, last Friday, so it's a fresh piece of uh, law. And uh, while Krzysztof gave an overview of situation in Europe, I would like to focus more on the Polish context. I, I represent the association Renovation Wave, which was set up by the leading producers of technologies and building materials uh, who, who want to promote, first of all, the uh, right way of approaching building renovations and building renovations as such. So the quality and quantity of these renovations and why. And I think we have to start from that point. I mean, on one hand, obviously, EPBD is a tool to implement Fit for 55 and the European Green Deal. But on the other hand, it was set up to address a number of um, very important problems, starting from social issues such as energy poverty, which we have, as mentioned already, um, we, we have more or less 100 million, more, more, one, one, three million, I think, according to the data of the uh, households which fight with the energy uh, poverty, uh, but also that is related to the health issues of uh, people living in poor quality housing. Uh, and I think that is around 900,000 people uh, having these various types of illnesses because of that. Uh, then, of course, the issue of air quality. It's another one that uh, is pertaining particularly uh, to Poland as 90% of coal used in the household sector is uh, being burned in Poland. So that all these issues are related. So EBBD also, I mean, modernizing our buildings and improving energy efficiency of our buildings will help people to finance the living and uh, not to have to choose between, uh, you know, buying uh, food and drugs and, uh, and daily uh, items and, and paying for, for um, having warm uh, houses. Uh, but also EPBD and this whole issue of buildings very much is related to the economic situation. So uh, business see the uh, trajectory of um, housing renovations that EPBD uh, sets up as an opportunity to create long-term plans and also to plan for capacity uh, of production of building materials. Um, as for the moment, uh, or without this kind of uh, commitment uh, on the side of the state, it's unclear whether it is real priority or not. We have this long-term innovation strategy set up in um, voted in uh, 2022 by previous government, but still we are not monitoring as a country whether it's um, uh, implemented or not. So EPBD and the national renovation plans that are part of EPBD, uh, that will be part of the structural documents actually facilitating energy transformation, uh, will help us to, to create this kind of uh, planning. Another thing is the role of buildings, and I said about energy poverty and, uh, and quality of buildings having a, a, a role here, uh, the economic development, but also the energy transition. So buildings consume around 40% of energy, and buildings, particularly in Poland, consume a lot of uh, fossil fuels. So if we want to make an, an, a transition to... Uh, renewables and, uh, and, and change our energy systems, we will also have to reduce energy demand in buildings. And the BPIE Institute made some mm, very interesting report, but reports, but in one of them, uh, they have calculated, the colleagues from Brussels, the amount of uh, fossil, particular fossil fuels we can uh, save uh, if renovating, if we renovate our buildings. And for instance, for gas, uh, it's 36% in Poland, even more uh, in, uh, 
for coal. As, as I said, 3 million more or less households are still hit by coal in Poland. So this will have huge impact and positive impact uh, if we renovate these buildings according to the plans uh, for the whole transition process because we are we have a challenge as a country to replace the fossil fuel with the renewables. We will have less energy needed for buildings. This energy can be used for the building sector itself, so to electrify buildings, but also in other sectors that will need this energy because... Well, the trend, the general trend is electrification of the economy. So that's the third point probably uh, that EPPD uh, will bring around if implemented. Now the challenges. And I would agree definitely that the main challenge is to build a positive narrative and to explain these benefits to... to I think... I mean, I used to work in self-government in Warsaw. I was responsible for the uh, sustainability in Warsaw, in the in the city hall. Mm, and uh, I guess it's much easier to explain to the population that we uh, devote money for uh, PVs, for instance, than, uh, than for buildings renovation. It's kind of politically less uh, attractive for some reason, maybe because it's not... Uh, not so visible, although you can have a great uh, renovation. We do have examples of great renovations. So that will be a task of the government. We have a challenge in Poland that we do not have an owner of the of the issue of buildings renovation. This 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 theme is split between actually three ministers now: Ministry of Climate, Ministry of uh, Development, Ministry of European Funds, and it's actually hard to say. Who would be the leader of such narrative? And I guess that's a decision in front of the government if if we are going to make this change. Uh, and then there are technical issues. And technical issues are related to lack of data. Uh, we do not have a whole country database of buildings. We, we have samples. We do model. They are think tanks that model energy consumptions. And, and they can provide some picture of how the building sector looks like. But we do need to have more concrete data if we want to um, address this problem in an evidence-based way. Um, and I guess the challenge, apart from energy classes that are in working, I hope the government will uh, adopt, this, uh, adopt this law by the end of the year. Uh, but we have generally in this country challenge in making uh, evidence-based policies. And this is very complex policy because as it was, it was mentioned already, it touches um, various uh, stakeholders. Uh, buildings are very different. Uh, they, there is no one database. The needs of these people are different. We have self-governments. We have dwellers of single houses. We have multifamily flat buildings uh, and so on. So it's a very complex policy design that is needed here. And it will not happen by itself, this process. So we need a leadership and we need... A, good policy in order to move forward with EPVD. So that, I think it's a challenge, but also it's a huge chance to to deal with the issues that were not dealt with, although we did have strategic Polish documents, but somehow we could not implement them. We did not track the records. So we don't know actually which kind of results they did bring. I hope that with implementation of EPVD, with the necessity and obligation to create the national renovation plans, that will change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rutger, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, thank you. First of all, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with this very well-informed panel. Um, I feel a bit sad that I'm the third person speaking, so now I have to come up with something original. Um, so maybe to start off with your questions, right? So wh why is this relevant for our area of activity? So at the Building Performance Institute Europe, we've very closely monitored the evolution of this EPPD recast from the first commission proposal in 2021 until last Friday. Um, so for us, it was very excited to s exciting to see that it finally got over the finish line. Um, and I agree that... It is not as ambitious as it could have been, um, but at the same time, we believe it's also important to see the opportunities that are in the current EPPD recast and 
that brings me to your second question. So what are the biggest challenges? And here I'm going to echo the other speakers. So I think the first challenge that we see relates to what you already mentioned is the need for good policy. So EPBD recast is a rather high level document that's formulated in a way that it can apply to all member states. Because obviously all member states have different challenges and local conditions when it comes to the energy mix, the makeup of the building stock, uh, ownership structures. Um, so that's important. And it's formulated in a way that allows member states to then implement it at national level. And I think there, I fully agree that this is a challenge. How are member states going to actually implement it? This should be done in an effective way. And that's challenge one. Effective transportation effectively transposing the EPPD to national level. The second challenge is what what was already mentioned related to energy poverty and doing this in a way that it's just so that we do not create unnecessarily high burdens for households that are already struggling perhaps in light of an energy crisis. Um, so these are these are uh, these are the two challenges and I think what I can maybe add to what has already been mentioned is that the EPPD also, includes several elements and here it might get a bit technical but for example the national building renovation plans were already mentioned this is really a tool in which government should show which are the policies that we're, that we're going, to, going to implement to which buildings do we apply how are we going to fund the different measures we propose so this is a way in which this is an opportunity in the coming two years member states will have to draft this 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 plan this national building renovation plan this will be sent to the commission for review and then come back. And this is also an opportunity for energy experts and building experts like us to, to chip in and to support governments in, in drafting effective policy. At the same time, there is a need for data um, and there are several tools in the EPPD that are support, supposed to, to, to make it easier to collect data. So for example, uh, building renovation passports, It's these are sort of additions to energy performance certificates that give the energy labels. Um, and this is tailored to specific buildings, explaining how they can go get to these 2050 targets and do that in a way that you take the measures in the right order and don't uh, replace your heating system before you've insulated your house because this will increase your costs. And at the same time, if households have, or, or institutions have questions, which they will obviously have, there should be these so-called one-stop shops. These are centers that should provide tailored information. It should be a center where you can get information on financing, get tech, get get in touch with technical experts. Um, yeah, so that's another example in the EPBD that shows, uh, well, that provides a pathway for governments, if they want to, to provide the necessary information to people, but also to collect the data necessary to do some monitoring and and, and shaping the policy. Um, yeah, and then maybe related to this 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 just uh, transition, um, we will talk about the social climate funds, and also there there will be similar type of strategies comparable with the national building renovation plans that are supposed to give, first of all, the government, but also the rest of society, clarity on which policies will be implemented, and that's really an opportunity for for us to well contribute and to 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 help the government to draft effective policies. Thank you very much. I think that after this first round of questions, we are all pretty sure that the EPBD is not only the technical issues, it's not only about buildings, but it's also about policy making, social approach, and also uh, supporting the most vulnerable groups. So the links between the EPBD and the social climate fund are, are pretty obvious, uh, I think, for us now. And uh, also achieving zero emission standards for new constructions uh, is an undoubtedly the complex issue. But I would argue here that the true challenge lies in renovating existing buildings. And I'm also relating to the to, to your opinions that one of the main challenges the, is the energy poverty and also the um, renovation of buildings they are owned by households in difficult financial situations. And um, I would like, well, maybe ask Rupert now, <laughs> just to give you the uh, first voice. Uh, can the implementation of emission standards for buildings uh, help protect vulnerable groups? And so what measures do we need to enhance 
uh, to to have just to enhance the energy justice and equal access to energy. And how can you ensure that the benefits of renovation are accessible to all and that we will not leave anyone behind? Thank you. It's uh, the hot topic, the minimum energy performance standards. For those who have followed the evolution of the EPBD, they might have heard about this this measure that was proposed to ensure that the worst performing buildings in the building stock will actually be renovated. And not only by incentivizing uh, building owners, but by, by also mandating that this happens. This is obviously quite controversial because you're well, directly reaching to, to building owners and forcing them to do something. So in the current EPBD, it's formulated in a rather broad way. So um, the EPBD sets out that in 2013, uh, first of all, let me backtrack. Um, there's different requirements for, on the one hand, non-residential buildings and for residential buildings. So there's different approaches. For the non-residential buildings, there will be specific thresholds uh, that should be achieved by a specific year. So in 2013, um, non-residential buildings will not be allowed to consume more energy than a specified number. And, and again, for 20, 2033. Um, and for residential buildings, there should be a national trajectory. So defined at national level, spelling out how a specific amount of energy savings will be achieved at the stock level for residential buildings. So we're getting quite technical here. And I think what is important is that member states will have a lot of flexibility to define these, uh, these at least for residential buildings, the trajectories of renovation. And at the same time, the European Commission is still working on a guidance for member states to actually implement this because some of these measures already exist in European countries and the Commission will support everyone to do this. Now, what is important to do this in a way that it supports uh, people in need? Um, I think one thing that's very important is to have a national definition of energy poverty, which is not always present. So we need to know which households need sp special support. Um, then when we design these kind of policies on national level, um, there needs to be specific attention for those in need so that there is financial support for households that are suffering from energy poverty that cannot afford to renovate their houses. Obviously, it's in general required that there is sufficient financial support um, to make it feasible um, for both companies and, and households to do the renovations. Um, yeah, and I think again here, uh, the social climate plan to which we'll talk about later will also play a role there because it will help to mobilize funding. So I think I'll just repeat, definitions of energy poverty are important. Uh, we need to target the right households with our support and there needs to be sufficient support. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, many questions arise during we are talking. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, refer to this uh, policy implementation that we are talking about and uh, like a very smooth implementation into the national law. And I, I see a kind of diverse approach here as the uh, EPBD directive has a clear top-down character. Uh, and on the other hand, the social climate found uh, was created in response to the grassroots need for support of vulnerable groups that we are referring to also. But in both cases, in both cases, involving a wide range of stakeholders in these actions are emphasized. Uh, and I wonder how this process should be unfold, should, should unfold. And I will address this question to Justyna. So please, uh, would you explain why it is so essential to involve a wide range of stakeholders in implementing social climate fault and the EPBD directive and which institutions and organizations should uh, should be considered first? And perhaps uh, maybe some insights of uh, whether you see some barriers in social dialogue regarding uh, the building renovations. Thank you for this question. Just to follow up, on what was said, I believe that one of the challenges is that this uh, whole topic of uh, EPBD implementation, but also the 
uh, rational policies that will uh, help to distribute the funding in the framework of the Social Climate Fund is that we need to link or the bridge to bridge the social policy policies with infrastructure policies. That is to break the silos that are kind of characteristic to probably all public administrations and in Poland particularly. So uh, if we want to have um, successful policies that will redress the inequalities and that will address those in the highest needs, um, we need to combine these two fields, and, and that's clearly a challenge that we have not made uh, for the last uh, years. I guess there was no such a policy, broad policy program. And we are in, well, this this will be one of the largest infrastructure programs, or even the largest infrastructure program. So uh, we need to be very careful about, you know, not not losing the opportunity that comes with the additional funding. And just to show you the scale we have, I think when we combine the cleaner program funding that is also having a component for the complex renovations, when we combine the future social climate fund and the European funds, the uh, recovery fund, Phoenix, we, we will have uh, more than 100 billion just for buildings. When we add the PVs and uh, renewables to that, that will rise to 300 billion or more. So these are really monies with which we can make change. Uh, so for me, particularly important is to spend them wisely and not to lose the opportunity to bring the long-term change. Uh, this is a lot, but on the other hand, when we look at what Polish government and other governments in the EU have spent to be um, for for the fuel prices to, to uh, subsidies for uh, helping the poorest uh, households in dealing with the rising fuel prices and energy prices, uh, that was more or less the same in the last few years. Amount of money, so in Poland, it was more than three percent of GDP. Uh, being basically burned out. So uh, that that shows that there is a risk and uh, we have to cater somehow for that risk that we are you know, not using this money properly, that we are not using them for the structure change, but um, just the immediate needs that are obviously on the ground as well. So there needs to be a balance. And in order to have this process somehow designed in a rational way, I guess that best of all, uh, we need to have a general agreement on the government side of what is the goal of the policy goal. So we need to have an agreement between all the ministries I mentioned that where are we going actually? For instance, uh, which are our um, goals in terms of uh, reducing energy poverty, improving air quality, how much we want to save energy from building sector, like a concrete um, targets, because without concrete targets, we are not going to reach concrete results, I believe. Secondly, obviously government is not going to deliver on that by itself. I do not believe in fighting with energy poverty, with issues that are locally based and place-based to a large extent. Uh, from the you know central government level, so a very important stakeholder here will be self-government. Not to say because of the fact that they have a lot of buildings, and they also bear the costs of those buildings. And we have the, uh, the well, self-governmental buildings the uh, for the poorest people uh, who also have uh, sometimes pay a lot of money for heating because you know these buildings are not connected to the central heating, people are heated with electricity or with coal and so on, with all the consequences I mentioned before. So definitely self-governments are such an important uh, stakeholder. And then, as we spoke all together about the narrative, I mean, we need to have everyone, everyone on board and people need to understand what are the benefits, not only the cost. And in order to have it, you know, we... There needs to be, um, it's not about explanation, it's about 
accessibility of instruments that will allow people to tackle the issue. And first of all, what was mentioned already, the, like the technical aid with these uh, special structures, the one-stop shops or whatever we call it in here. But uh, clearly that's, and all the studies show that's one of the main challenges to set up an institutional structure that will help people to actually get the advice where, when it's needed. And secondly, financing. This is a huge, uh, as I said, investment program. And although the money that is coming is huge, I believe, uh, you know, it's far not enough for the, in the context of um, the investment needs. So we need to mobilize private sector and commercial financing. And the good thing is that a lot of these uh, renovations, building renovations are basically bankable investments. They're bringing profits because of the savings that um, they bring about. So um, the, the tools such as ESCO, energy saving companies, PVPs in general, these are the tools that need to be uh, utilized in order to mobilize private capital, also the green bonds for the self-government and others. So clearly there is a need for the close discussion with the uh, financial sector. And um, so the public money should be directed in those, uh, into those investments that are basically with long-term repayments and that are commercially difficult to, to cover with the private money. And then we have to create the appropriate financing mixes to basically to blend private and public money. And it's also a policy challenge, clearly. Uh, so, so we have some other ministries uh, coming into play here. Uh, so therefore it's so complex and so challenging, but I, I guess everyone will be involved as, uh, you know, the scope of stakeholders is huge and, uh, they all have different needs. And if we want to have them on board, we need to offer them the opportunities and present them the pathways to, uh, address the issue. Thank you very much. And as uh, we are uh, talking about investments, if you are talking about funds, I will put uh, the next question very straightforward to Krzysztof. So can we afford this? Can we afford this and how the Social Climate Fund uh, can help in this process that we are facing? Well, the Social Climate Fund is there uh, to make us afford this, of course. Uh, but I, I want to be very clear so that we don't have an impression that the Social Climate Fund is just a technical response to the EPBD. It's um, a bit different and much more, and I will explain. It's a bit different because uh, the Social Climate Fund was um, designed to to respond to the extension of the um, emissions trading system, the ETS, on the building and transport uh, sectors. It's connected to EPBD in a way that it's part of the uh, Fit for 55 package, but um, it was meant directly as a response to to ETS to do extension of the uh, of the ETS system, or actually, uh, in fact, in practice, creation of the of the new ETS system for buildings and uh, and transport. And it's much more because it's not just envelope with money that we can spend on. Uh, mitigation uh, of of the problem of, of of mitigation of energy poverty and transport poverty. Uh, it is actually uh, the first opportunity we have to solve the problem, to mainstream uh, the um, tackling of energy poverty across funds and policies in the EU. How we can do it? Because uh, if any of you, I guess many of you are um, familiar with the recovery and resilience plans. The social climate plans that uh, the member states will have to submit uh, as early as summer next year uh, to the Commission for uh, for negotiations um, will have a very similar structure. They will consist not only of investments, but also of reforms. And this is uh, extremely important. Justin also mentioned it. Um, to to know where we are going, how we want to get there because of this reforms um, aspect. And uh, the uh, regulation on the Social Climate Fund is, is clear what needs to be included. Of course, uh, usual suspects, uh, the uh, increasing of energy efficiency in buildings, um, decarbonization of heat sources, 
uh, deployment of uh, renewables uh, and so on. Uh, but the funding uh, is there. It's substantial, but it's still limited. Uh, for Poland, for instance, it will be with the national contribution around 15 billion uh, euro. It's just one fourth of the current uh, recovery and resilience plan. So it's not uh, some enormous money, but it's money that has a real opportunity to improve the situation if we use uh, this as an incentive uh, to, to invest more, if we incentivize the private market uh, to invest in energy efficiency, if uh, we use, because the social climate plans can uh, dedicate uh, some part of funding to direct support to the low income households to uh, to mitigate the the um, effects of in introduction of the ETS to a uh, system in, in buildings and transport sector. Um, if we use uh, them smartly and if um, direct support is conditional upon uh, certain actions like increasing energy efficiency in buildings, but with uh, support with using the one-stop shop solutions uh, introduced by the uh, EPBD. Um, and uh, in Bankwatch, we uh, produced a number of recommendations how we should approach the social climate uh, plans uh, programming and, and social climate fund uh, programming in the near future to make the best uh, of these funds that we have uh, available. Because the, the programming period that will start soon, it's starting in uh, different countries, uh, will be um, will be extremely, uh, extremely important. Um, I will not, of course, uh, quote all the recommendations. I will encourage you to visit our site, bankwatch.org, and, and find our um, paper from December last year with the recommendations. But the most, um, the, the key points that we listed there are for sure um, the open and participatory programming process. It's not um, empty speech. We are not um, talking about this just for the sake to, to involve stakeholders. Stakeholders can really bring uh, substantial input. And we are talking here about municipalities who know their uh, local citizens, who know the needs, who know the specificity uh, of the municipality. And they need to be involved in collecting uh, data that will be then used to program, plan the social climate uh, plan. Uh, we need um, involvement of, of experts and, and stakeholders on every stage. Uh, uploading the draft social climate plan on the website for 14 days uh, for submitting inputs, it's not the way that we should proceed and we should definitely learn from the experience of the National Energy and Climate Plans Revision that is now coming to an end. Uh, and uh, according to assessments, um, ours, the Can Europe assessment, uh, it didn't meet the um, public participation standards whatsoever in practically all uh, EU countries. We should learn this lesson and do better now. Uh, we should use the opportunity to exchange uh, between EU member states and we see, of course, the role of the civil society organizations. We do it on a small scale, but the European Commission should be very proactive here in providing for um, this platform to, to exchange ideas and experience good practices uh, among uh, countries. Uh, we need to use synergies with existing EU funds. Um, the Social Climate Fund can amplify the uh, and multiply the effects of the just transition fund we need to take over from uh, the recovery plans the, the recovery funding that is coming to an end in 2026 20, uh, um, we have opportunities to top up social climate plans so it's not this 15 billion for poland we can use modernization fund uh, we can use the national ets revenues to make more money for uh, what we plan in social climate plans. Um, of course, we need to prioritize the most vulnerable beneficiaries, what I said in the beginning, uh, also by mobilizing uh, private uh, capital. Um, in Latvia, where we work, um, the initial plan by the government is to invest most of the social climate fund in mitigating transport poverty, no funding for building renovation. But if properly planned, the reforms uh, in, in the plan can 
mobilize other funding, cohesion policy, national funding, or private funding. Um, we should definitely focus on transformative measures. It's not only um, insulating, renovating houses or replacing boilers. Energy communities are one of the examples of uh, initiatives that can be funded and that have a great potential of uh, bringing people out of the energy poverty. And last but not least, alignment with uh, climate targets. The social climate plans should see the bigger picture of the climate targets of the EU and should contribute to achieving them. Sorry for being so long. We have many recommendations, but it's a big challenge ahead of us. Thank you. Hey, so Stina, please. Yeah, I would add that uh, uh, the public programs, they have to basically complement each other, those that exist and those future programs and not compete with each other, which is sometimes the case today. So again, we are coming back to this policy planning and, and governance and the quality of governance. Not just that. Would you like to add something? I can just agree with this. It's very true. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. Again, it's here a point of effective transposition of these directives. And specifically when it comes to the emission trading scheme, um, for those who don't know it, it means that the energy costs for heating buildings, for example, will get a, get a carbon tax, which will increase the prices. And this obviously can have negative consequences for people that have a little money and uh, need to spend a bigger part of their monthly budget on, on heating. Um, yeah, and I, I think you already covered quite a bit in terms of the the importance of, of using the funding that we get from these, these emission trading auctions in a, in, a, in a wise way. I think one, I'm, I must say my my expertise is mainly the EPBD, but, uh, but I think there is, there is a lot of overlap between different directives. Um, and, and also here, um, there is, and I think one critique that I have, have heard is that right now there is a very specif specific duration of the, of the social climate fund. So it runs from 2026 to 2032, I believe. And uh, there's a German Institute, the Oiko Institute, they published a report that said, yeah, even if we would now start renovating, structurally renovating all the households that are potentially energy poor. Then we could not do that in in six years time so there, there there might be a need here for some more flexibility um and also there is a specific amount of money in the fund but in the end prices will will change as we've seen over the last three years the variability of energy prices is very high um so that's basically it would be better if we implement the policy in a way that there's more flexibility both in terms of the time we need to provide structural solutions for, for people in need um, and, at, and also in terms of the amount of funding that's necessary because these are factors that might change. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to just add one small remark as we are now talking about the buildings. Uh, we should uh, say that the Social Climate Fund is divided into three parts. So it is uh, dedicated to the buildings, to the transport and mitigating the added uh, transport exclusions and also the issue of uh, energy intensive uh, micro and small enterprises. So this is the third uh, pillar of this fund and also a big challenge. So the Funds that are available in this fund must be split into three actions. So I think that we should also remember about it. And before we move to the next round of questions, I would like to open the floor to our audience. And I encourage you to speak up if you have any questions, comments. Uh, so please, yes, we have one question. So first question. Dzień dobry Państwu, ksiądz Stanisław Słowik, dyrektor Caritas z Kielce. I zanim zadam pytanie, to pozwolę sobie kilka cyfr dla zobrazowania sytuacji, ale nie wiem, czy ktoś przetłumaczy naszym gościom. Otóż... Padło tu kilka razy właśnie już stwierdzenie, że 
zapóźnienie energetyczne w budynkach jest ogromne. Któryś z panów powiedział, że to jest 70% budynków, które na dzisiaj wymagają modernizacji. No i przed chwilą właśnie pan przywołał raport niemiecki mówiący o tym, że w 6 lat to się na pewno tego nie uda, nie zdąży się. Ja chciałbym pokazać to na konkretnym przykładzie. Jako Karita Skielecka obsługujemy w tej chwili 50 budynków mieszkalnych. To jest 1100 miejsc opieki całodobowej typu domy pomocy społecznej czy zakłady opiekuńczo-lecznicze, chyba 130 miejsc dla osób bezdomnych i 12 obiektów zbiorowego zamieszkania w mieszkaniach indywidualnych. W skali roku poprzedniej zimy to spowodowało zużycie 1500 ton węgla, około 400 ton peletu i jakieś 650-700 tysięcy na gaz. Płynny i, i sieciowy gaz ziemny, więc daje to skalę właśnie zużycia energetycznego. Powiedziałbym, że połowa z tych budynków jest w dobrej kondycji oszczędności energetycznej, druga połowa niestety w złej, bo są to budynki stare i tu od razu powiem, Pani wspominała o potrzebie zaangażowania samorządów w ten proces właśnie termomodernizacji, czy w ogóle wsparcia w ochronie kosztów ogrzewania. Natomiast samorządy na dzisiaj namawiają mnie, żeby przejąć starą szkołę z lat 60. czy 70., bo nie mają pieniędzy na jej remont i nie mają pomysłu na jej funkcjonowanie. Więc tym samym udział samorządów w tym procesie modernizacji budynków wydaje mi się bardzo niewielki. I jeszcze jedna uwaga, trochę właśnie pod adresem też gospodarzy dzisiejszej konferencji. No ja żałuję, że w tym panelu nie ma nikogo, kto bardziej krytycznie patrzy na tę dyrektywę, ED, dyrektywę PPD, bo w moim przekonaniu czy odczuciu ona jest jak najbardziej słuszna, ale na pewno niewykonalna w tym terminie więc wypadałoby bardziej twardo stąpać po ziemi. No i ostatni wątek, to chciałem zwrócić uwagę, że jest na dzisiaj sporo programów pomocowych, czy z KPO, czy już z nowej perspektywy funduszy regionalnych. Natomiast są one póki co w tym obszarze dedykowane do przedsiębiorców i do samorządu. Nie ma żadnego programu dzisiaj aktywnego, który by był kierowany do organizacji pozarządowych. I to jest dramat, bo ostatni konkurs, który ja pamiętam, to był w 2017 roku, gdzie organizacje pozarządowe mogły aplikować w zakresie ochrony powietrza. To był bodajże Fundusz Norweski. Więc w tym momencie no, jesteśmy w bardzo kiepskim położeniu i nie wierzę w to, że cokolwiek znacząco się do 30 roku zmieni. I ostatnia uwaga, wczoraj usłyszałem informację, że w, w 2028 roku ja jako Caritas zapłacę w granicach 500 tysięcy złotych składki na ETS-2 ze zużytego węgla w, w roku 27. To jest tragedia. To znaczy, że my się mamy złożyć na ten fundusz klimatyczny. Dziękuję. Okay, thank you very much. I will just try to explain the question a, a, a bit. <laughs> so there are like three issues uh, here. Uh, the first one was about uh, the involvement of uh, the uh, municipalities and local governments into the process of building renovation and the lack of proper funds for uh, the, uh, the side of local governments to run this process. Uh, The second uh, issue was that we are uh, too optimistic <laughs> about the EPBD. However, we still have another round of questions, and I'm sure we will address this issue. And uh, uh, the third one was the lack of the of the proper programs to involve the local uh, the uh, non-governmental organization to uh, to be uh, I, like actively engaged in the process of uh, building renovation. And now I, I would like to ask our panelists to, to react on this comments. 
maybe I just refer to these self-governmental parts. Obviously, you're right, the self-governments today are not in the capacity to uh, realize or implement such a huge investment program. But, uh, well, the situation is even more difficult than a few years ago, as after reforms, subsequent reforms uh, of the last Polish government, uh, the self-governments lost the... Um, huge money for investments, but also in terms of operational budgets. So it's not only the investment capacities, but also the readiness uh, to carry out such a complex program. And that has to be clearly addressed. As far as I know, there are some works that started with the Ministry of Finance to restructure the whole way of financing self-government. Self-government should be uh, well, more independent and they have to be self-sufficient in terms of fin financing their needs and the needs of the population. So obviously this is a more structural issue and it concerns not only these building renovation programs, but other uh, programs related to delivery of public services in Poland. Um, clearly we have spoken here about involvement of various actors and that's exactly why those actors have to be involved. So the self-governments, they can identify best their needs and the needs of the population uh, in their municipalities. Mm, but at the same time, I think Krzysztof spoke here about the need for broad social, but meaningful social consultations that would help to identify these kind of policy gaps you mentioned that clearly for sure uh, exist. Uh, I'm not so sure, uh, well, I'm not that pessimistic as there's a lot of new programs being designed at the moment, uh, especially for those funding that is uh, supposed to arrive in the next few years to Poland. These will be new programs and I believe uh, there are efforts on the side of the government to address all, all these uh, major needs. Uh, I heard even yesterday in the National Environmental Fund that there will be new program for the uh, multi-flat buildings um, for building for renovations, um, and clearly, yeah, the quality of this consultation process will be fundamental for the quality of the programs later. So we need to take care of it, and the government needs to show the sufficient openness uh, for the uh, social voices. Thank you. Um, I would like to also thank you for the for the question and most and foremost uh, thank you for the incredible work that Caritas is doing in in Poland. I think it's uh, extremely important and I fully understand the concerns that you that you raised. It's not that we are uh, here um, that enthusiastic or optimistic on on the um, um, on the good implementation of the EPBD and the, and the social climate um, fund, we we rather share our recommendations, but we also um, share our and, and and also share your concerns regarding how it uh, how it can um, go possibly wrong. Um, as for the involvement of um, the uh, civil society organizations. Um, I, I fully agree with Justyna that uh, we should ensure the participatory and open process of uh, programming during which uh, we can um, properly identify the beneficiaries of the Social Climate Fund. Uh, and I can't imagine that NGOs won't be among them because they are uh, an important actor here in terms of uh, building uh, sector. Um, how to do it? We have the partnership framework in the in the EU, the European Code of Conduct on Partnership. Uh, we very much encourage the government to use this framework to um, involve uh, civil society organizations in a structured and organized way in in programming of this uh, of this instrument. And as for the mitigation of the um, contribution that you will have to uh, pay as part of the ETS2. As an idea, the Social Climate Fund with its, its direct support part uh, should be of help here to mitigate uh, this uh, contribution. But again, we are back at the programming to, to make it properly work. The concern that we have is that 
um, the programming uh, can take long and the ETS uh, tool system may be launched before we have a good operational uh, social climate plan in place. So we will have this gap. You start paying contributions uh, under the ETS, but you don't have the proper social climate uh, plan uh, distributing the, the social climate fund um, money. Um, hopefully it's not going to happen. We will try to make sure it won't. Thank you. Maybe short reply. I fully share the concerns. Um, I would say policy making generally is sort of a work in progress. Um, it's it's not not ideal as it is. Maybe one uh, perhaps relevant comment relates to the uh, division of the the, the the revenues of the the social climate fund that it is at least distributed differently among member states. And I believe, for example, Poland is one of the greatest beneficiaries that should get around, like I think around 20% of the total fund would go to to Poland. And it sort of the European policymakers are aware of these issues. I think even in the EPBD, for example, the, the importance of local authorities is, is stressed. Um, we will publish another report on the EPBD, I think in the coming two, three weeks, specifically focused at local authorities. So... I believe that policymakers are aware of these issues. And again, I come back to this point of effective transposition. I think that's that's the, the, the big challenge right now. If we implement it in a way where we take these concerns serious, then there is then it's a big possibility. But there is a risk that, that national policymakers have different priorities or are focused on something else. And I believe that's where we have a role to to keep them aware and accountable of of how they how they design national implementation. Do we have also the question online? So, from the online public, uh, I will uh, first I will uh, I will read the second one, uh, which is probably the uh, least difficult. Uh, there is innovative technology available that could help to reduce, reduce CO2 emissions in the construction of new buildings, which also helps which more energy efficient buildings. Have any of the panelists looked uh, into using geopolymers? <laughs> if I would say not specifically geopolymers, but I presume that that's for insulation or did, did, was that specified? That the, that's the only question. Uh, that, that, that's it. That's it. If this is difficult. Yeah. If, yeah, that's, this is what I have read. I personally have not looked in geopolymers. I mean, neither we deal with all buildings and renovations mainly. Yeah, just uh, maybe one sentence because we also haven't looked into geopolymers uh, in particular. Uh, but um, what what we recommended is um, using the the synergies with other funds, and we have, for instance, the Innovation Fund of the EU, uh, the tool, the the instrument that is designed to um, to to support research and development of um, of innovative technologies that can be used for decarbonization. Uh, so um, I can't comment on this specific solution, uh, but uh, what definitely we recommend is uh, including in the social climate plans uh, the R and D, the the research and development component that will enable use of um, these innovative technologies that. Many of them uh, presented recently, and they can for sure be for sure be of assistance in in building decarbonization. One question over there. Good morning, uh, Boris Sharakchev. I'm representing uh, Architects Council of Europe. Well, uh, you were talking quite a lot about the um, <clears throat> energy poverty, which uh, uh, refers my, mostly to the historical buildings. 25% of the buildings which are existing right now are historical buildings. And um, in fact, they required a big in financial investment. The 
uh, technologies we can use are very limited, restricted by conservators as well. And it caused that uh, it makes changes of ownership, the, which uh, also have an impact to the cities, especially touristic cities. And um, uh, they are losing their genuine loss, loss and Moreover, the banks uh, uh, don't uh, treat uh, uh, historical buildings as a possibility to, uh, of the guarantee of the loan. So uh, how to approach to this problem and uh, what to do with it? Thanks for the question. Um, we, as PPIE, have been involved in a project looking uh, at energy poverty, um, specifically in Central and Eastern Europe. And first of all, you're totally right that there is a big issue with historic buildings and that these have heritage value and that it's more complicated to renovate them. But we also see that energy poverty is, is spread out over different types of buildings. Um, so also buildings that have been built later, uh, but just are badly insulated, uh, are just as well susceptible for energy poverty. I think that's why it's so important to define energy poverty at a national level to be able to start measuring. For example, I come from the Netherlands and in my country, most historic buildings are inhabited by very rich people. Um, and they have enough money to, to make these buildings look very nice. Um, and for us, most of the energy poor people, they live in sort of terraced houses and multifamily apartment buildings. Um, so I believe that, that it's very important to, to focus when we do these renovation measures, obviously also on building topologies. So for historic buildings, different measures will be required probably than compared to other ones. But... I would say, based on our experience, there's also a lot of energy poverty that's not fitting in this specific category of buildings where we can use, uh, well, relatively more simple measures like insulation or replacing windows and and then actually improve the conditions of people living in these buildings um, and the energy performance. So it's like a win-win. So maybe just to add, we have a lot of buildings from 60s and 70s that are actually a problem and challenge for Poland. So it's not necessarily historical buildings, but actually, historical buildings in a problem and a category in itself. And from my perspective, I actually live in this kind of building. So I know on daily what it involves to deal with the um, yeah, serve, uh, public services um, that guard the, uh, the value of the buildings. Um, but I believe that what we need definitely is uh, the countrywide standards because things that are allowed in some regions of Poland are not allowed in other regions. And it's actually individual decisions of the conservator, conservator, whatever, <laughs> don't know the name, uh, that, that guides the, uh, you know, the investor and it, it should be, uh, well, more uniform throughout the country. We had some public policies uh, that addressed these buildings, like Pałacyk Plus, the... Uh... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and uh, But they did not bring about the fundamental change. So I believe these buildings would have to be treated in a separate way with the countrywide standards and with the separate um financing and rules of financing at the same time looking at other countries like france and um, italy countries with lots of historical buildings there are a lot of examples of successful renovations of these buildings uh, perhaps some of the uh, technologies are not as popular in poland as over there and we need to look at them and search for the best examples <laughs> There is also a very strong new part. Okay. Um, hello, uh, my name is Julie Lawson. Um, I was the lead author of the report for the UN Housing 2030. And I wanted to emphasize that there's a whole range of tools and best practices that are in Chapter 4 of that report, which are online at the Housing 2030 website. But um, in thinking about beyond um, the immediate member states of Europe, um, we're thinking always about Ukraine in these days. 
So how do you see this new um, potential on fr from Friday as influencing or contributing to the Ukraine plan, Ukraine, the, the facility and the investments there that will be made as part of the chapter in the Ukraine plan on energy efficiency? Will there be a link between this effort and uh, Ukraine's recovery and rebuilding future? So I can briefly comment on this because some of my colleagues have been working on a report uh, specifically focusing on different criteria for uh, investments in energy efficiency in Ukraine. And obviously uh, these type of aspects will be very important that when we build back, we do that in a way that it's future proof and that we do not, uh, well, build what was already there. And uh, so, yeah, totally support uh, this. And thank you for this question. Me, let me read the voice from Ukraine. Greetings, experts. It's for you. Uh, question. Thank you, everyone, for helping the refugees. Now in Ukraine, there is a large group of five houses in the first mass series, uh, which requires immediate reconstructions with simultaneous thermal modernization. Some of these houses were partially destroyed by military actions. In Ukraine, there is an innovative patented technology that effectively solves the above problems. How it's possible to organize cooperation with the bank for the practical implementation of the project? I mean, this person is to ask. Yes, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, of course, the uh, when we speak about the challenges with implementation of EPBD, social climate plans, and, and so on in the EU. It's completely different from the challenges that Ukraine faces that are enormous. Um, but the reconstruction in uh, in Ukraine, for, for, for Ukraine building stock, uh, is the opportunity to apply the standards uh, with the reconstruction and with building of, of new buildings, replacing the ones uh, destroyed in line with this European Aki that is now being um, complemented by the revised um, EPVD. Uh, so to, to use the, the good practices and standard and, and solutions to avoid the situation uh, that uh, the now reconstructed uh, and insulated buildings they have to be insulated again or renovated again in in few years to to reduce the uh, energy bills. Uh, the energy system in Ukraine is very much touched by the Russian aggression, uh, so uh, it is very likely that the energy prices after the war will also be the challenge. So we always have to keep in mind when uh, the Ukraine facility is uh, designed and the specific solutions that we apply the most energy efficient measures. Um, and uh, while uh, the programming of the of the Ukraine facility goes a little bit different paths than the EU funds for member states, of course, the these standards uh, set out in EPBD and these lessons learned by the member states while programming the social climate plans should definitely be uh, analyzed by Ukrainian experts and authorities and to extent possible applied in the uh, funds directed for, for the reconstruction um, of Ukraine to not only thinking about climate because in reconstruction after the war of course it's not the top priority but thinking about the society and the, and the impact of the society the future energy bills uh, to when we reconstruct the buildings to make them the most livable possible. Thank you. So as we are running out of time, just let me uh, let me just ask the last uh, question and ask our panelists to sum up our discussion. But uh, through uh, uh, maybe I would like to propose a, a way to do it. Um, I think that we should also think about the risks associated uh, with uh, implementing the EPB directive. And uh, I would like to ask you if you see any risks that uh, could potentially lead to negative social reaction. And I would also ask, uh, like to ask you uh, about the, uh, the my opinion or your opinion, in your, your opinion, what statement 
should resonate in a public debate what we are talking about implementing this this direct should i start okay um well i believe that we have to look at the pbd and all the accompanying funds the social climate fund as the opportunity uh but then whether we will utilize the benefits that it's linked with this opportunity, it depends fully on us. And it's not some external factor, it's not the EU, it's Poland, Polish government, and that refers to other countries as well. Um, these are the stakeholders that will make it happen or not, and the risks. Uh, obviously, the, I think we all try to convey the message here that it's a complex issue, and it's a complex policy, a complex program, that is linked with, uh, well, with this prospect of eradicating uh, energy poverty, increasing the security, energy security, by uh, limiting consumption of the uh, solid fuels and, um, well, carbohydrates in the building sector. Uh, it's a chance for the economic development, new jobs, and so on. So it's all sorts of uh, opportunities and benefits related but in order to reap these gains, we need to have public policy programs. We have to we have to well work together, convince the society about re uh, that these opportunities are real, basically. And uh, and in order to do to do so, I think we have to all play to the same direction and uh, create basically efficient programs, uh, set up a network of institutions with technical aid the financial instruments, uh, energy classes, all the mechanisms and tools which will help uh, people to actually also reach this money. As, as the first question here uh, concerned that issue, they, they have to see the opportunity to utilize the money available and then we will bring this uh, process to the happy end. Well, I'm... I spoke a bit about uh, our concerns, challenges, and, and risks today, starting with um, the the pure poor organization of the process that uh, ETS can be launched before the social climate plan is there and running. These are, of course, the, the, the big challenges. But what we observe now with uh, farmers' protests uh, all across Europe, um, this is the, the risk that I would highlight now in, in, in my last words today. Uh, the big risk of a social backlash uh, caused by disinformation, misinformation, um, external and internal propaganda spread across the social media. Just look at Twitter. Uh, important politicians yesterday, not going to name them, posting uh, absolutely fake news about EPVD again and again and again with no um, straight response from, from, from our side, people who... Uh, know the directive, know the system, and and can reply, can discuss its bad and good sides. Uh, but the the most important is to 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 fight this message that this is some Brussels organized tyranny uh, designed to extract money from Poland and other countries through ETS revenues and store them somewhere under the Berlin on the building in Brussels because this is simply not true. This uh, whole system is designed to increase the carbonization and at the end of the day, reduce uh, energy bills for citizens, improve the climate situation, improve the citizens' health through uh, providing for the clean air. Uh, and, and this is something that we, uh, that we should stress, uh, that this is in our favor, even if it needs to be improved in certain aspects. Thank you. I fully agree. So what I could say is that indeed the EPBD is an opportunity, it's a possibility, it's sort of a, a seed that can be planted by national policymakers that can grow into a, a tree that bears fruit. Uh, but it, for that, it's very important again, this transposition. So effective transposition is key for that we need clear messages and we need to keep in mind social impacts and ensure that households in need and vulnerable groups, this can all be also be smaller companies that they feel supported. Um, yeah, so effective transposition and making sure that social impacts are covered. Okay, so 
uh, our time, the time for our uh, discussion is coming to an end. And unfortunately, we could not answer all the questions, but uh, I think that there's still an opportunity to continue this discussion one to one, maybe in the foyer. And I, I want to thank you for all the valuable insights and comments. Uh, and I think it has been a really uh, insightful and interesting discussion. And I'm pretty sure and I believe that we will re, uh, revisit this topic in the future. So thank you very much. And thanks. Well, 